Well, welcome everyone to the Data Simulation Uncertainty Quantification Predictability session. This is the first of two oral sessions today. Uh, just to remind everyone, can you please silence your mobile phones? This first session is actually going to be recorded and will be available on, on demand at a later date or actually being live streamed. I can't remember which, they didn't tell me which way around it is this year. Um, so it's now 22, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, which is Amy Braverman, an invited speaker from JPL, who'll be talking about uncertainty quantification for optimal estimation retrievals. <laughs> so how do we get that up on the screen? <laughs> Yay! Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank the conveners of the session um, for organizing this um, and for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is some work that we've done at JPL um, in the broad area of uncertainty quantification. And I believe that when I sent in the abstract, it was uncertainty quantification for remote sensing retrievals. But since that time, I decided to be a little more specific here and talk about something called optimal estimation retrievals, which is one particular type of remote sensing retrieval. Um, so I'm, I was last week at a meeting uh, called a jihadi. Uh, and so I'm going to be jihadi here and uh, make a couple of assertions about what my opinion is about what uncertainty quantification is in the world of remote sensing retrievals. I think um, let's hope everybody in the room is familiar with the concept of a retrieval. A retrieval is the uh, name given to the process of inferring uh, some state of the atmosphere from some observed quantity like the number of photons that hit your spacecrafts or your space instruments detector in a particular period of time. So it's fundamentally an inference problem. Um, and therefore, what you find in your data product um, after you have done this, this uh, operation called the retrieval um, is in fact an estimate of some geophysical state that you're interested in. And uh, here's the jihadi part of this, is I'm, I'm a statistician, and so uh, to me, the omnibus definition of uncertainty quantification is characterizing the joint distribution of the quantity of interest, that's the thing you really care about, and the estimate that you've produced. Um, and there are many ways to reduce down this description of uncertainty. Um, a lot of times people like to use the bias and the variance of the difference between the true state and its estimate, but you could just as easily use something like the regression of the estimate on the true state or vice versa. Um, now, um, if you are familiar with optimal estimation retrievals, then you know that optimal estimation um, is an implementation of Bayes' theorem. Uh, that is used to help make these inferences of this true geophysical state. Um, and uh, Bayes' theorem tells us, I think we'll get to that in a minute, Bayes' theorem tells us that um, we treat both our true quantity of interest and the thing, uh, the inference that we make from it as random variables. And uh, so the quantity of interest, many, many physicists don't like to think of the quantity of interest as being something that's quote unquote random, but the key thing is, if you're a Bayesian statistician anyway, you are willing to think of anything that's unknown as having a probability distribution. So it may or may not be, in truth, a physically random process, but if you don't know it, then you can model it with probability. Um, okay, so an estimator is a function of the data you collect, and the data you collect at any given point in time and space uh, is quote unquote random, um, usually because it suffers from measurement error. Um, and you can argue about whether the true state that gives rise to the measurement that you actually make is random or not. But in any case, there's always measurement error on any measurement that you make. Uh, and so our estimator is always a function of something that's random, and so the estimator itself is random. Um, and so its behavior is described also by a probability distribution, which I've called P of x hat there. Now, x hat as an estimator of x is some function 
of what we observe. So let's pretend, for example, in the remote sensing world, normally what we actually observe are radiances from the spacecraft. Uh, and those radiances are functions of the true state of the atmosphere. So in my picture there, the true state of the atmosphere is given by the X's, uh, the X sub I's, let's call them, or the X sub N's. The, um, what you're observing is G of X, which would be a radiance, because nature converts those true states into radiances that we see. And then our estimate is some complicated or maybe not so complicated function of those things that we see. That's the F. So if it's the joint distribution of the quantity of interest in the estimator that we are after here, then we have a small problem. We don't know that true joint distribution. We would like to get it. Um, let's say we do know P of X hat, which is the distribution of the estimate that we get. Uh, and we do know, we probably do know F because we're the ones who are going to decide what that estimate should look like. We know what the algorithm is we're going to use. We don't know G really because G is nature's true forward function that turns our true state into observed radiances. So, so optimal estimation is a computational implementation of Bayes' rule. Um, it's used by a lot of remote sensing missions. A couple of them at JPL are the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2 the tropospheric emission spectrometer and the microwave limb sounder. And what this does is it says, hey, we'll solve this inverse problem of telling us what we can know about the true state given the radiance spectra that we observed by using this little formula that you probably all have seen for Bayes', Bayes rule. Uh, in practice, uh, implementing the solution to this equation is not a trivial thing, as you know if you know anything about satellite retrievals. Um, there are lots of computational compromises that have to be made, and there are lots of things we actually wish we knew, but we don't know. So we fix them to certain reasonable values and use those fixed values. And all of these things create, quote unquote, uncertainty or errors, if you like, in the retrieved, quant in the retrieved estimate relative to the true quantity that we're trying to get at. So um, optimal estimation retrievals actually um, yield two quantities. Um, they yield a, an estimated posterior mean, which I've written there as the expectation of x given y, and an estimate of the posterior variance, the variance of x, uh, of x given y. So there's, there's a bit, uh, it's easy to get confused here, um, because when you're sort of inside the retrieval game, you're producing estimates of EX given Y and the variance of X given Y. And if you're in the uncertainty quantification game, you have to step outside of that and you have to look at that and ask how good those estimates are. So uh, the optimal estimation retrieval algorithm produces a probabilistic description of the true state in the form of an estimated posterior distribution, but that's not the same as the probabilistic characteristics of the estimates on which you're basing that. So that's a crucial uh, distinction to be made. Um, so the way I think about it anyway is that these optimal estimation retrieval algorithms, no matter what it is they're trying to produce, uh, they're complex estimators of something. In this case, the true posterior mean and true posterior variance of the true state given the observed radiances. Um, Optimal estimation retrieval algorithms are not themselves UQ algorithms. They're like any other retrieval algorithm whose uncertainty properties you would like to quantify. Um, so here's how I'm going to write it down. I'm going to call X hat uh, the estimate of the posterior mean and S hat the estimate of the posterior variance. And the question at hand is how good are these estimates of the true quantities? Now we don't know what the true quantities are, so that's our problem here. But we would still like to be able to get at that. Um, so this is what we wish we could do. Here's how I would define uncertainty quantification. Um, we st if, if we knew the distribution of the true state, P of X over there on the left, and we knew the true, nature's true forward function, F naught, and its associated parameters, B naught, then that would allow us to create an ensemble of observed radiances to which we might add measurement error that we supposedly know the statistical characteristics of from laboratory studies. And that would give us an ensemble or a distribution of observed radiance vectors y, um, which, if they're paired up with the true state vectors that gave rise to them, we then have a representation of the joint distribution of the true state and the radiances. And from that, we ought to be able to somehow engineer the posterior, the true posterior distribution of the state given the observed data. 
Uh, and from that, we can pick off the posterior mean and the posterior variance of that distribution. Now, of course, we can't do that in real life, um, but let me not get ahead of myself. Let's say on the other side of it, as a retrieval person, um, I would take my ensemble of radiance vectors and I'd put them through my retrieval algorithm. And notice that my retrieval algorithm depends on certain things. It depends on something I've called F1, which is my best guess at what F0 really is. And it depends on B1, which is my best guess of what B0 is. And these two other things called XA and SA, which is the common uh, notation for so-called prior mean and prior covariance matrix that are used in the retrieval. And what these are are estimates of the prior mean, let's not call them the prior mean, let's call them properties, the mean and covariance matrix of that distribution P of X over there. So what comes out of the retrieval is this pair X hat, S hat, or Maybe it's just a single estimate, depending on how your retrieval works. And the point is here to compare the retrieved quantities with their true counterparts, which is effectively um, talking about the joint distribution of X hat with an ensemble of true posterior means and S hat with an ensemble of true posterior variances for those joint ensembles. And here I've shown that we crushed it down in the way that statisticians like, which is to reflect, um, give a description of those relationships through the bias and the variance of the quantities. Now, if we could do this, we'd be done. That'd be great, uh, but we can't. So uh, what we've done at JPL is we've decided to do a big simulation experiment where we try to mimic this as closely as possible. And let me just point out a couple things to you. The first and probably most important thing is that we have to come up with a, post, with a um, synthetic distribution of the true state that we think is a realistic description of what the true state really is. It doesn't have to be exactly identical to the true distribution of the true state, because if we knew that, we'd be done already. But it should be reasonably realistic. Now. Another thing we should note here is I've may put in orange that I've used F1 and B1 there in the part of this simulation experiment that simulates radiances. And that really wouldn't be fair because I, I, this is the only forward function that I've got and so I've got to use it there. But if I use the same forward function in that part of the simulation experiment as I use in the retrieval, then I'm giving myself an unfair advantage because we know that we don't know what nature's true forward function is. So we're gonna compensate for that by adding another little component of uncertainty up there that I've called model discrepancy adjustment. And I don't have time to tell you how I got that, um, but I'll be happy to tell you offline if you're interested. And it has to do with comparing um, what OCO2 calls the spectral residuals, which is the difference between the observed and uh, predicted uh, radiances. Um, Okay, so now I'm gonna to proceed to do exactly what we talked about on the earlier page, which is to link up that simulated ensemble of Ys and the ensemble of true states X, and now I've given everything a little sim. And I don't have t time to tell you how computationally I was able to turn that into a posterior distribution, but I'll be happy to talk about that offline as well. Uh, and I can simply proceed as I described on the previous page. Now, let me just, I will give you a quick example for OCO2 here, where OCO2 has an approximately 50-dimensional state vector X, the first 20 elements of which are the, um, are, represents a vertical profile of CO2, and if you weight average those to get a total column mole fraction of CO2, that's something called XCO2, and that is the um, the X hat and the S hat that we're going to compare are going to be for that quantity rather than for the full state vector. And I'll just show you real quick, here are a couple of joint distributions showing the performance of X hat and S hat from the simulation study. And what we would really like is each of those things to line up with high probability along the ridge that represents the one-to-one -one line. So you can see that the computational artifacts that were created here um, have created some distortion in our ability to accurately retrieve the things we want to retrieve. And uh, going back and fixing those is something that I think the team would really like to go and do, um, and something we would like to report in the product in some way. Now, since I've only got 30 seconds left, I'm gonna go straight here. Uh, I'm almost done. Uh, and I think all of this is probably pretty obvious. Um, let me say that this is not a perfect thing. It's one 
tool in the box that people can use for uncertainty quantification. Of course, it relies on having a good distribution of the true state that you're willing to use to drive this whole thing, because if you're going to assume that these properties hold in the true data, then you have to do the simulation experiment in a realistic way. And I'm going to stop there, because it's zero right now. So you have to ask me later. Okay. Let me just do, just do that for legal purposes now. Okay. Time for one quick question. Yes. yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm slightly confused. Uh, nature has run its course. As you know, when you've done, when you do your uh, measurement, nature has run its course. So this is one true state. There's no distribution here, but one true state. So I, I guess what, you, what you're getting at is that, and given that, that you have these observations and, and my final guess, I can try to find the theory that we have of that system. And I, only have, I can only estimate what that theory that's right. I mean, two. Yeah. There's one what? Sorry. There is one posterior PDF per retrieval or per footprint. And what we have to do is amass a collection of them that we believe are exchangeable in the sense that they all, that that ensemble P of X represents a plausible set of outcomes for that one retrieval that we're talking about. And of course, that depends how you choose to draw those. Those could come from reanalysis. They could come from uh, a data set. They could be something that I ask you to tell me what it is as an expert. But it all relies on the idea that that, is a, that, that ensemble that I've used uh, for X sim is a reasonable representation of alternative plausible outcomes for that retrieval or for that state. I'll get you offline. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So if you can all come down this <clears throat> seat at the front here, apply regulations. We do need you not to be standing in the back door, please. So our next speaker is Max, and he'll be talking about combining Gaussianization, Gaussianization with diffuse based correlated mo correlation models for simulating sea ice. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I, w I will talk about uh, recent efforts at uh, the Naval Research Laboratory to improve the forecast skill of the operational model, of the operational ICE model. And as you can see from the title of the talk, uh, uh, these efforts were made basically in two directions. One is introduction, introducing Gaussianization in the operational scheme, and another one is introducing the diffusion-based correlation modeling for account for uh, <coughs> anisotropic and inhomogeneous correlations throughout the model domain. So the first problem uh, with uh, <coughs> assimilating of ice concentration is, of course, non-Gaussianity of the state which is being assimilated. And the current operational model is based on the standard biasing hypothesis about the Gaussianity of the mm, increment, so the final formula is uh, very common. So there is a li linear transformation of the uh, <coughs> on the innovations which produce increments and both innovations and increments are assumed to be Gaussian. But if we look at the uh, PDF of the ice concentration, uh, it's completely non-Gaussian, so it's just the second uh, the, sec uh, the second panel. And uh, what is usually done in practice when we uh, consider non-Gaussian distributions is the, using the so-called univariate Gaussianization transforms, which is a nonlinear function of the state variables. So you can uh, <coughs> transform uh, ice concentrations to a variable which obeys Gaussian uh, distribution. But the problem with this is that uh, our final objective was to mm, produce improvement of the short-term forecast, forecast skill. So, and especially in the, in, uh, during the times when ice fields are highly variable, so PDFs every day uh, uh, change a lot. So, using uh, this univariate transform may introduce uh, very big errors, and in that. In that case, we moved from transforming, transforming of the original variables to transforming the uh, increments and uh, increments and innovations. So as we see, in this case, we do much less errors in these transformations, 
but on the other hand, we have to uh, reject, uh, we have to abandon the idea of strong constraint on the innovations we get after assimilation. So, and basically, the major challenges which uh, have been we encountered here were, first of all, the operational model is the ensemble-free method. We cannot estimate uh, PDFs, local PDFs, and even the global PDFs from uh, <coughs> from the ensemble members. So we just have uh, a single, <laughs> so to say, single ensemble. So we have to make an averaging of uh, horizontal space. And another problem is that uh, the covariance, covariance which is uh, in operational model, is a kind of uh, heuristic covariance based on the uh, assumption that correlations uh, obey a certain uh, simple analytic expressions. And therefore, Gaussianization of the covariance matrix uh, becomes computationally unfeasible. And that's why we have to do another huge assumption that in the Gaussianized variables, we keep <coughs> the mo our model of the covariance intact. So these are a lot of assumptions which has been made because of the limited amount of data and computational abilities. So uh, this is a few uh, formulas just to show the idea of the standard schemes which uh, perform Gaussianization and Gaussianization. We have a source cumulative density distribution uh, which we retrieve from the ice concentration <laughs> increments, uh, innovations, and then we apply uh, the inverse of the target uh, P uh, CDF to get the transform, which is called here G, J, and the formulas are pretty common. And the second item is just we uh, try to introduce inhomogeneous and um, <coughs> anisotropic uh, correlation model into the system, which we model with the exponent of the diffusion operator and the diffusion tensor field, which is D here, was modeled in a way that the longer axis of the, uh, the major axis of the diffusion tensor was aligned during, uh, along the velocity field and the diffusion was, uh, so basically we, what we modeled was the square root of the diffusion tensor. So basically the entire algorithm was uh, made in four major steps. First, we did Gaussianize, Gaussianize the innovations using the transform I showed on the previous slide. Then computed the Gaussianized increments using the standard formula. C is the correlation model, which is based on the exponent of the diffusion operator. H is the model data <coughs> mapping operator. And here, uh, what I would like to emphasize that as we are uh, performing this stuff in the Gaussianized variables, we can uh, assume that the uh, model data um, mapping operator is much more, so to say, round. So it introduces uh, much better conditioning in the system. And because after Gaussianization, we, uh, we transform the, all the variables into variables which have unit variance. So and this uh, <coughs> improved the convergence of the scheme so much, much for the scheme, much faster convergence. After that, we did the inverse transformation, but because of the, all, all these errors using the assumptions which uh, I was talking about, the result uh, was not really uh, good in the sense of the improving of the forecast skill. That's why we had to introduce the so-called correction of the for this degaussianization errors. These corrections are related to the correction of the um, uh, prior error variance of the model fields. After that, after we made these corrections, then we uh, realized that the forecast scale of the system improved. So, and uh, uh, finally, uh, the whole system, I'll just show you the results. The whole system was <coughs> tested in the uh, Beaufort Sea during, uh, in, sep in September, October, and December. So the coverage of observations were by observations were, was pretty dense. We had about 20,000 of ops per, per day. And uh, these are the sea ice model at two, two kilometer resolution. Uh, the dimension of the state vector was about half a million. So 
And this is a slide just showing how does the correction of the mm, variances uh, prior model variance work. So when we transform on the, on the left upper panel, we transform the yellow PDF into Gaussian, which is shown by the blue curve. But after doing a simulation using this global linear transform, we obtain the, uh, the <laughs> yellow uh, PDF, which is a bit different from the, Gauss, from the Gaussian, because we do the transform globally while PDFs are just the margin, marginal PDFs. We cannot do the global transformation of the global PDF. So for that reason, we have to do the correction of the variances on the error on the left on the on the left panel we see the correction field which is basically a small scale field but after that uh, we after this correction we get uh, uh, much more robust increments compared to the op operational system on the on the right there is operational increments on the left there is uh, increments after using the optimization transform and finally, uh, these are just the improvements of the forecast skill, which was uh, measured as the one minus ratio of the squared innovation of the tested state to the squared innovation of the reference state. So if it's positive, then we get, uh, we get in improvements. So uh, the uh, gray curve on the lower panel shows us the thick gray curve, so show us the improvement. We see that it's positive all the way until the uh, ocean freezes in the mid-November when ice concentration fields do not have, uh, no, do not carry any information on the, on the dynamics and the kind of weathers. So this is an example of a comparison of the 24-hour forecast skill versus persistence. So uh, the, operational <coughs> the operational model is shown by the thin blue curve, upper, upper panel, and the Gaussianized, uh, Gaussianized simulation system is the thin, uh, thin black curve. And the, uh, I just skip these details. This is, from my point of view, an important thing. This is a distribution of the mean uh, magnitudes of the increments among 10 ice categories, so between zero concentration and 100% concentration. And we see, so, the blue lines are the uh, magnitude of the increments produced by the Gaussian ice system, and they are kind of on the average shorter, shorter than the yellow lines. But what's more important, we get much better, much higher improvement at the edges of the distribution. So for concentrations which are close to zero and for <coughs> concentrations close to 100. Uh, this is a, also an example of uh, introducing the anisotropic uh, covariances into the model, which also gives us, gave us a bit, uh, not, not as big improvement of the forecast skill, but still pretty valuable, about 2 to 4 percent. The upper panel shows all the reds, uh, just the improvements. And finally, regarding uh, the summary, so uh, uh, our Gaussianization methodology was kind of a bit different from the traditional ones because we did not have uh, an ensemble information and besides we were confined to uh, using the operational <coughs> correlation model based on heuristic modeling of the correlation. So we could not transform the correlation model uh, into Gaussian ice space and vice versa. And what we did, basically, we did the correction, correction for the degaussianization errors via the adjustment of the forecast error variances. And as we believe this uh, scheme can be, is, can be applicable only when the correlation, correlation model is valid in Gaussianized variables and we have dense observations. So, and below there are some preliminary testing results of the system. Thank you. Time for a couple of quick questions. Yes? Uh, uh, you think the uh, Gaussianization is uh, divided by a variance. This is general or because uh, uh, this is only applied to your uh, ice model? No, basically you can apply it to any, uh, any model which is, uh, in, involves non-Gaussian variables like concentration, phytoplankton or whatever. 
So ice variables are just a particular case because it's kind of highly non-Gaussian. So you can apply this technique to whatever, all, all, the, all, the, all the models which involve non-Gaussian variables. Any other questions? Yes? Thank you for the talk. Uh, very good. Um, maybe it's a stupid question, but is it, is it possible to use copula rather than the uh, uh, correlation matrix to uh, uh, make it the different uh, realization in the phenomenon that fit it? Uh, I do not get <laughs> No, but basically we were confirmed because this this work is uh, <laughs> uh, just uh, very uh, concerns applications. We ha this is a kind of incremental improvement of the operational system. So we did we were not really very free in varying the approach. So that's why we just used the exact covariance model which is implemented in the system and just uh, try to improve it incrementally by. Uh, specifying an isotropic and homogeneous correlation. Thank you. We have to <clears throat> move on to the next speaker now. Okay, the next speaker is Tanya Janic, and she will talk about preserva preserving physical properties with the ENKF. And this is also an invited talk. Okay, so, the white one. Okay. so um, first of all, I would like to thank the conveners um, for inviting me here to give a talk in this uh, session. And uh, basically what uh, I would like to present today is the joint work with Yu Fei Tseng and Yvonne Ruckstuhl which is um, on the preservation of uh, physical properties when the ensemble type common filter algorithms. So we have been motivated by the NWP, so where uh, there is a long history of uh, numerical discretization schemes um, that incorporate the conservation uh, properties in order to better represent the continuous system. And uh, in NWP, uh, this has been shown to that it improves the prediction of the nonlinear flow. So the question which we wanted to ask is um, whether data simulation algorithms should follow a similar approach. And basically to answer these questions, what we did, we first explored which of the conservation properties are well recovered using the ensemble data simulation algorithms and which properties are not. And um, what we did, we actually designed the uh, ensemble-based data simulation algorithm which includes the constraints which are not well recovered and then we have shown uh, implications on the prediction. Okay, so here just a quick example of some of the, when some of the properties of the physical system can be lost. So if we consider a simple triangle here, which we would like to um, estimate based on the prior, which are perfect copies of this triangle just in the wrong location. And we try to estimate this based on the observations which are all positive. Um, if we use one stamp ensemble common filter, we would get the ensemble, um, analysis ensemble, which would generally have quite a bit of negative values, which are unphysical for this particular model because the values in the truth should be between the zero and one. And if we set these values equal to zero, of course we will actually destroy the mass, which is again fixed for this particular model. Okay, so this is what, that was one of the very simple examples, and then we also considered a little bit more complicated examples, so imitating what has been done in NWP. So we looked at what is happening with mass, energy, and entropy if we would be using the LETKF, and we looked at this 
depending on the different observational coverage and also different localization. And what we used was a nonlinear two-dimensional shallow water model, which is, has been discretized in such a way that mass, energy, uh, angular momentum actually is conserved, and entropy is conserved for the non-divergent non -divergent flow. So if we run this model, what we get is a picture like this. So um, we have a perfect mass conservation through time, and we have slight loss of total energy, basically during the period which is um, uh, which we do data simulation, which is the period at the beginning, the loss of total energy is about 1% and the total uh, loss of the entropy is about, uh, is about uh, maximum 5%. Again, this model does not conserve entropy, uh, it conserves it only for the non-divergent flow and we have a divergent flow here. Okay, so doing uh, twin experiments now where we would perturb the observations and assimilate them back into the model, uh, we looked what is happening depending of what we observe. So if we observe U, V, and H, we get the first column. If we observe U and V in this two-dimensional shallow water model, we get the second column. And if we observe H only, we get the third column. And what I'm showing here is the en energy in the top row and the anstrophy in the second row. And no matter what is the localization, um, actually, what we see is that uh, after a certain time, the ensemble common filter seems to be able to recover the total energy in the system. And this, uh, this energy of the nature run is given with the black curve there. However, if we look at the similar plot for the entropy, there is almost in all cases the entropy is overestimated. And in particular, if the observations are only of the height field, this uh, entropy even uh, diverges. Okay. So this, of course, has an effect on the kinetic energy spectrum, and which we have here on the top, the average over the first, after first five analyses, and the bottom average over the last five analyses. And again, we see in the smallest resolvable scales, so uh, a higher energy, higher kinetic energy than what is in the nature one. And once we start the prediction after this simulation, so which is, uh, uh, which is basically if we focus only on the red and the green line, what we see, although the RMSCs are about the same for this red and green line, the fact that we have uh, more entropy in the green line actually shows afterwards in the prediction and which have, we have a much larger error growth there. Okay. So how do we, uh, so here is a reference on the paper where we have actually much more than what I'm showing here. And um, how did we decide to resolve this issue? So basically we uh, started implementing the constraints in the ensemble common filter and the algorithm is described in the paper there. We call it the QP, so quadratic programming ensemble algorithm and which is extremely, simple to explain, I think, because basically what we do, uh, we modify the, uh, if we think of the ensemble common filter as a minimization of uh, a cost function where we modify each of the background ensemble members uh, based on the perturbed observations, we would get this cost function written there, and only thing which we did, we add a constraint, basically. We can add a linear constraint. This is a constraint for the positivity. Of course, what we did as well, we added nonlinear constraints. This, then uh, it's a little bit more complicated to solve, but it's possible as well. Okay. So as for the ensemble common filter, one can transfer into the ensemble space where this L matrix is then the difference between each of the ensemble member in the mean. If we have a localization, something a little bit slightly different but the, we transfer into ensemble space with do minimization there. In that case, we repeat the simple example from the beginning. We get uh, each ensemble member which is positive after a simulation. And we have further tested this in a slightly more complicated model which was actually designed for um, um, mimicking 
more uh, convective situations. This model is a modification to the shallow water model in such a case that it has a rain variable as well, in addition to the velocity and height. What we see here in yellow are different ensemble members, and this is just to illustrate the intermittent uh, variability <laughs> of, this, uh, of this model. And um, basically what we are observing is only where uh, we have rain, so basically mimicking uh, radar data in this case. And on the left, we see the results of the ensemble common filter, and on the right, we see the results of the QP ensemble. And basically, if we just look at uh, the so-called dry areas in these two results, we see that the biggest difference between these two methods uh, actually lies there, where the ensemble common filter produces this spurious, uh, spurious convection. Okay, so of course, this can, can be seen as well in the RMS uh, C's, um, where for each of the variables, so in the red, the QP ensemble results are given, and in the blue, of ensemble common filter results. And um, I would like to point out on the pictures on the right, where we see the uh, RMS C of the mass. And basically here, in this model, of course, uh, rain can become negative, and we set it to zero when we apply ensemble common filter, and this results in this increase in mass, uh, uh, the, so the blue line in the RMSC. And for the QP ensemble, we actually keep the mass equal to the mass in the forecast, and we constrained the rain variable to, to be positive. So um, correct mass actually then affects the mass of rain variable as well, which is better, um, better approximated with the QP ensemble. Okay. So we can look at this similarly, just in terms of the uh, number of ensemble members. And um, what is interesting here, that even if we are increasing the number of ensemble members, we are actually also uh, having a bias in the uh, mass. And um, after a certain threshold, uh, basically the ensemble RMC of the ensemble common filter is not reducing significantly. Okay. So I mentioned that we could apply this algorithm as well uh, for the nonlinear constraints, and we uh, extended it here to include the conservation of, uh, so basically energy, entropy, or energy and entropy together. And what is shown here is just a prediction, basically a 14 days prediction, starting from the initial conditions which either had um, energy conserved, anthropic conserved, or energy and anthropic conserved, or basically no constraints. And if you see at the beginning of this plot, all of this look um, have a pretty similar RMSC values for both uh, velocity and for height. But basically, after a day five, we see um, differences in the prediction, and the uh, results are the best if we conserve both uh, energy and entropy. Okay. So basically, uh, to conclude, so we have a QP ensemble algorithm is principally was first developed to address the problem of of positivity of conserving positivity method is uh, by construction a multivariate uh, method and uh, in general allows the inclusion of linear and nonlinear constraints and uh, it seems to improve the accuracy and the bias in the very simple problems. In addition, what we have seen is that the ensemble common filter is able to recover the total energy and mass, actually I didn't mention here uh, for the 2D shallow water model, but entropy doesn't seem to, uh, is not recovered and incorporating the entropy, so we believe is that we control the transfer of energy from the rotational part of the flow and this way Im improve the uh, prediction. And with respect to the convective scale applications, we are, by adding simply the mass and the positivity constraint seems to as well improve the prediction. 
And I would like to finish with the advertisement for a symposium on data simulation, which will be happening in Munich uh, at, uh, from 5th to 9th of March. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, so, um, of course, one of the things that a lot of data simulation can change is uh, the amount of energy and all of that is wrong, or the amount of energy and all of that is wrong, or the amount of energy and all of that is wrong. the data simulation change there, simply, it's not right in the model. And to make your methodology, we seem to make sure that the data simulation will not do what it can well, uh, so basically uh, what we are trying to actually, we try that the data simulation algorithm does not produce the numerical errors, basically. This is what we are trying to, to uh, prevent it from. And uh, what we have seen, the data simulation algorithm is not able to recover the entropy we were giving it. I mean, we were simply simulating constantly the data and we were getting the values which are higher than the values in the nature. So I don't know how realistic it is to believe that the data simulation would actually on the end change or produce the correct entropy as well. There's another question here. Yeah, if you look at the, at the next order moment, the balance No, this is as far as we went. All right, then let's move on to the next speaker and maybe thank Tanya one more time. Uh, Arkopal Dutt, and he will talk about uh, Lagrangian data simulation. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, this is a part of my ongoing uh, PhD research work. So the main domain of our interest is the oceans, and the ocean currents uh, transport a variety of substances, such as physical chemical properties of temperature, salinity, or even um, passive tracers, such as pollutants, floating debris, um, particulate matter, or even biology. Um, and if we were to understand how these passive particles basically evolve in time and track their particle positions, we can just simply integrate the velocity field. However, this is very sensitive to the small errors in the velocity field. And a more robust description comes in the form of um, coherent structures that basically tells us how these trajectories are organized and what are the barriers to these trajectories. Are these areas, are there areas within the domain that the trajectories cannot go to. And for example, on the right, uh, I show a pictorial representation of the surface temperature, uh, which is kind of indicative of the coherent structure. So you see that there is a boundary where under, uh, south of which you can only have hot water, and above which there is only cool water. So this is an example of a parabolic coherent structure. So if we know the background velocity field well, we can predict essentially what are the trajectories and what are the coherent structures. But um, having Prediction itself in itself is challenging because at the end of the day, you have errors in the model. There might be, there's some might be uncertainty in your parameters or forcing, and you might have sparse observation data to begin with. So this motivates the need for a probabilistic formulation, and at the same time, um, it, it, you want to assimilate any incoming data, uh, and be it from Eulerian instruments, which might be fixed moorings or sensors, but also Lagrangian instruments, which are dynamic. Uh, especially because these have very high spatial coverage, as you can see in the right. So the main theme of this uh, talk today would be about how can you perform Eulerian Lagrangian assimilation within one unified framework. And uh, the current, so there are like three main methods for carrying out Lagrangian data assimilation. The first method is essentially pseudo-Lagrangian schemes, where you basically look at the trajectory and 
treat it as a time series of particle positions, and then you estimate the velocity and treat it as Eulerian measurements. But it, in some sense, you have lost the Lagrangian information. The second one is uh, the augmented state vector approach where you augment the particle position now within your state vector and also augment your dynamical model of the tracer advection. Most of the current literature uses only linearized models or uses uh, Monte Carlo met methods for probabilistic prediction, which might be expensive if you have very high ensemble size. Um, and also perform common-based updates within the, the common-based updates during the assimilation phase. Um, and the third main approach is a Lagrangian observation operator where you create a measure model to relate your Lagrangian variables to your Eulerian state variables. And this might change from one assimilation time to another and is thus quite expensive to do. So the goals are basically make sure we're using the full nonlinear stochastic dynamical model to essentially predict what, how our Eulerian or Lagrangian variables will change with time and at the same time capture the non-Gaussianity of the PDFs. And at the end of the day, assimilate whatever information content we're receiving. So the outline of my talk would be essentially, uh, in the beginning, I'll talk about the accurate predictions of Eulerian and Lagrangian variables and how you can perform the assimilation. Uh, and also another question that we will try to address is, can we identify what are good locations to ma for making measurements or even deploy drifters from? So um, for a probabilistic prediction, if we consider a general dynamical system where the uncertainty is, uh, so where you use a random field and L is the dynamical operator, the uncertainty might be in initial conditions, boundary conditions, or parameters. So here what we use is a dynamical orthogonal field equations where we basically, what we do is uh, decompose the random field into mean, U bar, and the stochastic coefficients and modes. Modes are essentially the principal directions of my uncertainty, and why are essentially how the realizations vary with these um, uh, directions of uncertainty. And we, to get the reduced model, model equations for the mean, the stochastic coefficients, and the modes themselves, we impose an orthogonality condition that the modes can only grow uh, orthogonal to the explained uncertainty. So then we can um, essentially find out what is how my mean changes by just taking an expectation operator of my dynamical system and the modes from performing a Galerkin projection and, uh, and the coefficients. So the main takeaway from this is that uh, the mean itself is changing with the modes, and the modes are also affected, interacting with the other modes in the mean itself. And uh, for Lagrangian variables, so if we were to look at trajectories, we could just um, integrate the velocity through time. Uh, if we wanted to find out how all the trajectories within my domain were to, uh, were to evolve, I could seed drifters everywhere and then evolve those. But that's expensive to do, I mean. So rather what we do is a PDE-based approach. Uh, where essentially I have a forward flow map uh, described over the field, which tells me if I have a point um, at, that was released at x at time zero, where will it go next uh, at time t2? And if backward flow map tells me if I, have, if I see a particle right now, where did it come from? And this PD basically allows me to do that. And the great thing is now I can also easily use the Dew equations for doing this even in the stochastic case. And for the coherent structures here, the, what the measure will use is uh, the finite time lapin of exponent, which basically tells me how fast exponentially do trajectories deviate. So for the forward FTLE, it will tell me, are there any repelling manifolds within my uh, domain? And the backward flow map FTLE will tell me, are there any attracting manifolds? And um, I will also use a state augmentation approach, where I basically augment the Eulerian variables with the Lagrangian variables, and also augment my dynamical variable. Um, just before assimilation, I can also augment my state vector with uh, diagnostic variables, such as trajectories, like have the whole trajectory as an integral curve, or the coherent structures, um, which were computer for flow map. And what allows me, th this allows me to do is basically capture the correlations or even mutual information during the assimilation phase and update the entire state vector, irrespective of in which variables I actually make observations. And now my measurement model is now just a simple projection uh, from the state space to the observation space. And for performing um, the simulation, what I use is the uh, GM do filter. So I essentially do this in the subspace where I uh, fit a G Gaussian mixture model, and then I can carry out common like updates for each Gaussian mixture component, and then um, keep on doing this sequentially. So um, the first uh, one of the test cases that I'm going to show is the stochastic wind-driven um, quasi-geostrophic double gyre flow. So this is an idealization of uh, what, how the stochastic circulation might vary in the ocean 
uh, due to um, mid-latitude easterlies. And uh, so uh, on the right, I show what is the velocity field that we use to begin with. So this was uh, obtained from taking initial uncertainty conditions and then uh, evolving it over a time period of one year, no, sorry, 1.6 years, which we'll consider as uh, one dimensional unit. And I'll just show some um, twin experiments approaches that we carried out. So the first one is um, essentially we filter, um, uh, we have observations in drifters, uh, drifter positions as a function of time. And I show how we can basically improve our knowledge of both the velocity field and um, model trajectory itself. So um, on the top row, I show the first, the mean of the velocity field in the first mode, um, which is the dominant, um, which explains the dominant uncertainty, and then the mean of the model trajectory and the true trajectory itself. And in the second row, I show uh, how my variance will vary with time and the coefficient and the PDFs of my drifter positions. And below, in the last row, I have the RMS ER. So if I play this, um, oops, how do I, oops, sorry. So, um, if I just evolve this in time, so you can see this is the first assimilation, and you can see that the drifter, in fact, jumped uh, from to where it should be, more likely. And we can keep on doing this and see how the RMC error essentially improves. Um, now, if I had multiple drifters, um, it might not be very useful to actually, if I also wanted to find out how the model trajectories, all of the possible model trajectories are improving. So rather, I could uh, use the forward flow map. Uh, so here I show the prediction of the forward flow map over a time period of zero to um, about six days and how the coefficients vary. And I can also compute the prior forward F FTLE uh, from this. Uh, and uh, so now once you have performed the uh, state augmentation, uh, what we do is we rotate the modes so they have shared coefficients. And as you can see, it's quite non-Gaussian. So here I show uh, the joint uh, coefficients and the GMM fits. Um, I show the contours of the GMMs, which are marked by the red lines and they're colored according to how much they contribute to the GMM mixture. So, and we can see using the GMM, we can actually capture the non-Gaussianity quite well. And um, so the first test case that I show is basically I have only observations in the flow map, or essentially corresponding to positions of multiple drifters, which are marked by uh, the star mark. Uh, so once we have observations, we can basically find out the likelihood and then perform the Bayesian update. And we can do this in the, essentially the subspace. So here um, I, mark the posterior by the uh, green, uh, green lines. So you can see that the green contours marking the posterior GM fit essentially moved towards where the truth coefficient is, which is marked by the black line, black um, uh, circle. So you can see that we have an improvement. If we were to look at the posterior uh, mean, which is marked in the last row, you can see we have actually quite a uh, good uh, improvement. So we are able to uh, capture uh, we're able to capture the, like, the flow field features better. So we actually have the velocity, we were able to improve both the velocity and as well as the flow map and the other variables, um, even though we had only observations in the flow map to begin with. And I can now even do this considering that I have observations in uh, the Eulerian field of uh, velocity and not observations in other variables, but at the same time improve everything else. So basically, I have now like a framework for basically assimilating um, all like, of information, Eulerian and Lagrangian variables, and improve all the other variables. And this is like a, this is a picture representation of the fact that here also like we're able to improve the GM fits. So uh, now one question what I want to ask is, well, what are the good locations for to deploy drifters from? So um, like uh, we want to deploy drifters where to best basically identify and also explore the flow structures, and also obtain the most informative trajectories that tell us like how can we distinguish between the model predictions that we have? Another question that we might have is like, if we go out into the uh, ocean field, what are good locations to place sensors? And furthermore, what are the variables that we actually want to measure? And since the field is itself dynamic, when do we want to do this? So one, uh, the reward function that we use is essentially of mutual information, which is appropriate because uh, we want to basically capture the non-Gaussianity and it's uh, an ideal criteria for capturing the information content of uh, content of observations. So if we want to find out what are good locations uh, for it to deploy drifters from, I can find out what is in, basically measure the mutual information between all the model trajectories and perhaps the current structure, the flow structure that I'm after. So here I show the, on the left, the mutual information field for, uh, for uh, between all of my drifter trajectories and the FTLE field, 
that I show on the right for a particular realization. So the yellow, essentially, uh, shades of yellow mention um, mark higher mutual information. Locations where I actually want to deploy drifters from, where purple is the places where I would not ideally want to launch drifters from. And um, so now for adaptive sampling, uh, basically, so here I show uh, where we performed an experiment in the North Arabian Sea, uh, where we had um, measurements uh, from ALMO and sea gliders, and we were basically able to show that our model predictions perform well. So here I have a current structure field, again, on the top row, and I zoom into a particular area of interest. And here I uh, show the mutual information fields between salinity and the forward FTLE field, and the like the meridional velocity field and the zonal velocity field and the total velocity field. So you can see like where the locations, the, the, again, the shades of yellow, where I want to actually measure salinity is uh, not the same as where I would actually want to measure the velocity from. In fact, where I would want to measure meridional velocity from is different from where I would want to measure zonal velocity from. So um, these more forecast mutual information fields at the end of the day allow us to identify where would be good locations. And if I was at a particular location, then also tells me which variable I would want to measure. So uh, essentially, um, uh, we have showed that um, the Gaussian mixture model do augmentation approach is capable of capturing and also uh, carrying out this uh, coupled Euler and Lagrangian information um, assimilation, and how we can actually use the metric of mutual information to find out what are good locations or to deploy drifters from as well as assimilate observations. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. Question over there. How is this multiplicative noise during the uh, um, trajectory actually affect the results? Um, so uh, I consider um, that, um, so in my case, I'm considering only the trajectories are evolving with the velocity field. So I don't consider that there is an additional noise for the trajectories themselves, besides the measurement noise. So I don't have any stochastic forcing for the uh, trajectories themselves, for the, mod uh, the particles. Is this realistic? Um, uh, there could be stochastic forcing, so especially given like wind forcing. Uh, in that case, I could um, essentially, again, have a duty composition for that, and then carry out the probabilistic prediction again forward, and I would have new predictions, yes. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? All right, thank you. Okay, uh, next up we have Marcus van Leer Walke uh, talking about uncertainty quantification in cloud microphysics parameterization schemes. All right, uh, first I'd like to acknowledge um, my co-authors, uh, my collaborators on this work, Hugh Morrison, Matt Cumgen, uh, Olivier Pratt, and Charlotte Martinkus. And I'm gonna be talking about a, um, a new microphysics parameterization scheme that we're developing uh, to address uh, the sort of uncertainties that, um, that are found in, in microphysics parameterization. Okay, and just, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge funding source and also uh, Scott Collis at Argonne who helped us out with uh, distrometer data. All right, so the, the basic motivation is, uh, is that we have, uh, so this is just outline, uh, is that we have these errors and uncertainties and we have uh, new observational capabilities and we want to leverage those to, to constrain um, our uncertainties, but the current schemes don't really allow that. Okay, so we have our, our method, which is this new uh, microphysics scheme we call BOSS. I'll, I'll say what that stands for. And, um, and I'll show a little bit of results and have some nice conclusions, which are basically for now that we can match the behavior of a traditional uh, bulk scheme and that BOSS uh, does a reasonably decent job of um, predicting its error via its predicted uncertainty. Okay, so microphysics schemes have uh, all these errors. Uh, caused by uh, uncertainties and simplifications. So these produce uh, precipitation, precipitation forecast error. They can produce uh, poor ensemble spread. So there's a lot of uncertainty, structural uncertainties that we can't um, sample really. And uh, basically also these limitations uh, result in our inability to use these models to really understand what's actually happening in the atmosphere. 
Okay, so here's one very quick, or a couple of very quick examples. Here's a bunch of microphysics schemes in a, a simulation of weather. This is simulated reflectivity. And you can see that there's a, a lot of differences here. Um, there's observations there on the top, and then uh, uh, four different schemes. I believe one of these is a bin scheme, and the rest are uh, bulk schemes, if you know what that means. Um, this is another example. So this is just an idealized uh, squall line, again, a, a horizontal view of reflectivity. And this is just changing three uh, or three different options for uh, how you parameterize droplet breakup. So just a single process like raindrop breakup um, can make a big difference. Okay, and then we have all these great observations uh, provided by polarimetric radar, for example, uh, that give information about uh, cloud microphysics processes that we're interested in. So reflectivity is proportional to the sixth moment of the drop size distribution. You'll be seeing DSD a lot, so that's what that means. Uh, ZDR, that's differential reflectivity, that's related to the reflectivity weighted uh, drop size. Um, KDP, that's related to rain rate or rain mass. So these things give us information about, about the rain drop size distribution. Um, we'd like to leverage that to uh, learn about microphysics. All right, so what's the current state of the art is that we have a whole slew of microphysics schemes. And uh, each one of these has its own uh, uncertainty. Um, associated with the parameters, the coefficients within that scheme. Um, and then, so that, that's what I'd call parametric uncertainty, um, associated with these, these uh, tunable knobs. So if we consider the microphysics scheme a black box, there are these knobs that we can tune to try to make it better. Uh, and then there's a choice between these different models that's kind of a discrete choice, and that's sort of choosing between different black boxes. And that's, that's a way of, uh, that's one source of structural uncertainty. So between these different schemes, there are different assumptions, there are different simplifications. Some of them are bin schemes, some of them are bulk schemes. They have different numbers of prognostic moments of the drop size distribution, um, and different degrees of complexity. So th that sort of spans a, a wide range of structural uncertainty. We're not sure which one's uh, the optimal choice. Um, and probably it depends on the simulation. And it's kind of spanned unhelpfully because we can't sort of span the distance in between these dis discrete um, choices. Okay, so what would we like? What, what is our wish list? We'd like to not assume anything about the drop size distribution. So we'd, not like to, we'd like to not assume some functional form for that drop size distribution as is traditionally done. Um, we'd like to have process rates. So the process, by process I mean things like evaporation, droplet breakup, collision coalescence. Um, uh, I'm not sure if turning on that light was entirely helpful, uh, but I'll move on anyway. Um, so uh, we'd like to be able to um, kind of flexibly change the complexity of these process rates and not have that something fixed in the scheme and be able to tune that with parameters. Uh, we'd like to have very few uh, ad hoc choices and assumptions. We want our constraint to come from observations, really. And uh, we want to, as, uh, as I kind of said before, uh, have some sort of uh, complexity that we can add or subtract as, uh, as the observations demand. Okay, so this is BOSS, is what it stands for, Bayesian. We, we're going to treat our uncertainties robustly um, and constrained with observations. Uh, and uh, it's statistical physical, so uh, we don't just want a statistical theme. Uh, Statistical scheme. We don't want to just do some sort of like machine learning exercise. We want this to actually represent uh, physical processes. And it's a scheme. It's a bulk microphysics parameterization scheme. Uh, and right now it's liquid only, so just rain and cloud. Um, but if this ends up being helpful and successful, we can expand that. Okay, so what's the difference between this and a traditional bulk scheme? So in both cases, we're going to predict uh, the evolution of, uh, of drop size distribution moments, where a moment is defined by the diameter of the drop uh, raised to some power um, times the number concentration, and then integrated over that number concentra concentration. So for example, the zeroth moment is just the, the total number. Uh, the third moment is the mass. The sixth moment is the uh, reflectivity, and so on. Okay, so normally these schemes uh, assume some parameterized form for the, the drop size distribution, like an exponential or a gamma distribution, and uh, some fixed functional form for the process rates, so evaporation and so on. And then these things are set either empirically, or maybe there's some theory behind them, or maybe some laboratory, uh, laboratory measurements, or sometimes they're just set ad hoc to make the thing work reasonably well. 
Okay, so um, we're going to do the same here. Uh, the difference is that our process rates, oh, I should actually say that we're going to predict the evolution of these drop size distribution moments, but we never specify what the, we don't never specify a, a, a fixed form for that drop size distribution. So we predict the moments, but we don't actually define what that distribution is. So that allows us additional flexibility and, and uh, removes the sort of imposition of those assumptions. Then we, uh, we parameterize the process rates as power laws. Uh, where we can sort of add more power laws on as need be. So this is uh, d m d t, where m is some moment. Um, okay, and then we're going to constrain these uh, power law parameters um, by comparing to observations in a Bayesian inference framework. So, for example, using uh, MCMC. Okay, so as I said, one of the nice things we can do is we can systematically vary the uh, complexity of boss. So one example is just a two-moment boss, uh, the zeroth and third moment, uh, number and mass, and one power law term for all process rates. We can also have multiple power law terms for uh, process rates. So we've tested out just having two terms for evaporation. Uh, we can also have three prognostic moments instead of two. So uh, zero, three, and six, the number, the mass, and the reflectivity, for example and uh, one power law term for all process rates. So there, this is actually adds some interesting complexity because now the process rates for, for the zeroth and third moment will depend on this new moment. So uh, you're, you are kind of adding in complexity in the zeroth and third moment, uh, even though you're not adding in terms for that moment. Okay, and you can be creative also. Uh, this is a very flexible scheme, so you can predict any moments you want. You can even use non-integer moments uh, as prognostic moments. I don't know why you would, but you could. Uh, you could have hundreds of power law terms. It's, it's a very flexible scheme. Uh, I'm not sure how you would constrain the parameters in that case, but um, maybe somebody knows. Okay, so here's the general approach. Um, we, we're gonna uh, basically compare uh, in the screen here uh, the OBS, and in this case, this is a synthetic uh, observations uh, of, an, of a one-dimensional one idealized rain shaft uh, using some traditional microphysics. Uh, so this is a three-moment scheme uh, using zero, three, and six. Um, so it's pretty advanced, um, but it is a traditional bulk scheme. And uh, we retrieve the parameters of BOSS by uh, comparing the, the observations to the forward simulated um, rain shaft from BOSS. And the initial conditions, we're using kind of a climatological initial conditions to run this. So we've, we've done a lot of work just assembling um, drop size distributions that match what's, uh, what's really observed in nature and also um, rain rates and relative humidity. Uh, now, uh, what this will produce is optimal uh, parameter values, uncertainty in the parameter values, and uh, it'll give some measure of how well uh, BOSS is able to reproduce the behavior traditional scheme. Now, what we'd like to do is also run a uh, different complexity of BOSS to sort of find out what's the optimal complexity of BOSS um, needed to sort of match what we want it to match. And we'd like to uh, replace the, uh, the idealized observations with real radar observations. Okay, so there are some sticky questions here. I think I'm just gonna fly through or else I'm gonna run out of time. Um, yes, I'm just going to skip this completely. Uh, if you're really interested, you can talk to me. So uh, just this produces a parameter PDF for BOSS. So we constrain the parameters, and we have uncertainty that's given by, uh, by this uh, probability distribution. Uh, this was uh, done with uh, a Markov chain sampler. And so this is for the one power law term, uh, two moment. We also have uh, the two power law terms in evaporation. Uh, this looks a little bit weird for a good reason. It's not because it failed. Uh, and I can explain that if you're really interested. Um, this is for the three moment boss. So there's a lot more parameters. Uh, the, one, the one thing I'm gonna note here, which is kind of interesting um, and, and deserves further thought, is that all these parameters up here in this uh, upper left quadrant are sort of evaporation and fall speed parameters. And on the lower right uh, quadrant, they're uh, coalescence and breakup. So we're noticing that certain parameters are getting constrained more than others. Certain processes are getting constrained more than others by our observations. Suggest so maybe we need to work on uh, ideal observations to constrain this. Okay, now this should be able to predict, uh, predict something well. So these are different rain shaft predictions. So this is uh, profiles of 
uh, M0, M3, that's number and mass, and then also uh, rain rate at the bottom. So uh, the black lines are, on, are, are sort of uh, draws from the uncertainty of BOSS. Uh, if you can see a blue line, I don't think you can. That's the uh, optimal value of BOSS. And then the red is the observation. So that's sort of truth. Um, you can see that it matches in some cases. There's some uncertainty. Um, and in some cases, the uncertainty seems to be a good predictor for the error. In other cases, like the simulation seven, uh, right over here, it doesn't do so well. Um, moving on to two terms, it does a little bit better, but uh, not even enough to be worth talking about. Uh, for the three-moment bus, we actually get a lot better uh, performance in general, and very interestingly, the predicted uncertainty is a better match to the uh, forecast error. Um, so that, I think, is an important finding. All right, so we have some future challenges, and if, if anybody here has some suggestions for this, I'd, I'd really like to hear them. Um, so we'd like to develop some model selection or variable dimension inference to sort of estimate or constrain uh, just what the structural uncertainty is. So compare between different uh, versions of BOSS that have different amounts of complexity. Um, when using the observations, which observations should we use? How should we weight those so that they adequately constrain all the different parts of BOSS? And uh, yeah, actually that was the same thing, basically. Um, I'm not sure why meaningful is in italics. I think it looked more profound that way. <laughs> okay, so conclusions. We've developed this new scheme. Uh, we, the tests indicate that it's able to match um, an existing scheme, and it's able to predict its own certain un uncertainty, which is an important characteristic. Um, and we've also developed a moment-based probabilistic polar metric radar forward operator. Uh, so please travel back in time to see Matt's talk if you're interested in that, Matt Cumgen. Um, and we're nearly ready to perform constraint using real observations. So that's the future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, Marcus. Uh, are there any questions? Exactly. I also have a question. I couldn't quite see because of the new lighting mm -hmm. that is present like this in every room right now. So it wasn't just oh. you. Or it wasn't you in the back who turned on the light. There seemed to be some major problem. <laughs> um, but on your nice corner plot with, uh, I don't know how many distributions you showed there. Maybe 12, 12 times 11. That one. This one? No. More, this one? More, more. That one. That one. <laughs> but th that's the most uh, complex boss, right? So far, yeah. And, you, and if you, so I can't see, it really because of the light. So the, the distributions on the diagonal, they're very flat. I see. Um, so you mean the, the one-dimensional marginals? Yeah. In some cases, they are. Uh, certainly, for most of these over here, uh, in the lower right quadrant, they're pretty flat, which is, to me, indicating that there isn't much constraint from the observations. Right. And all your, your priors are always completely flat? Yeah, the priors are uniform. Um, uniform in the log space for the A, well, they're uniform, yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Great. Sure. Okay, thanks again, and uh, <laughs> we're gonna move on to the next talk, uh, which is by Peter Jan van Leuven. Uh, he's he's uh, trying to answer the question whether consistent equal weight particle filters are possible. Okay. Um, so, okay, thank you for, uh, for, for uh, being here. Um, so I'd like to uh, talk about this uh, specific subject and I'll explain what I mean with consistent in a, in a second. So the standard particle filter, I guess most of you know, right? So we have a, a probability density function. We have a representation in terms of a bunch of particles, as you see over there. We propagate these, uh, these particles to these model states forward in time with the model evolution equation to the, to the new observations. And there we are. And then we have observations uh, with their uncertainty, and Bayes' theorem tells them they have to multiply these two. And uh, so th these red bars now give us the weights of the particles. And you see in this case that there's one 
particle with a much higher weight than all the others. So this particle is degenerate. And another way of saying it, of course, is that the, uh, so this is a standard particle filter. You, you typically don't use that. Um, but for small ensemble, and small means typically, I don't know, smaller than maybe 10,000 particles or something like that. Uh, for real application, maybe 10 or 100. Um, this, this method is, is, is biased to the best particle. Um, so then, then we come, we come about, the, we're going to talk about the real question, that this consistency. With that, I mean that the, um, that, that the bias in the filter is smaller than the Monte Carlo variance. And, um, and we have typically sort of three methods floating around. One is localization, one is uh, using proposal densities, and the third one is using uh, optimal transportation. And I'm going to treat all of them if there's enough time. So first of all, localization. Um, so the idea is, of course, that if you have a measurement in the Mediterranean, say, and you're interested in the, in the uh, and you want to say something about the Pacific, then clearly there's no direct physical connection between these two. Eh? It takes some time. So there's no direct physical immediate connection between these two. So uh, it makes sense to localize observations. And by that, I mean, if I just take a grid point in the Pacific, uh, I only want to take into account observations that are close to that grid point. And close, of course, in terms of uh, close means in, in the physical sense. Right? So observation that really can, can influence that point. Um, so if we do that with a particle, so, so of course, then, then the weights uh, will start varying over the domain. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem there. If you look, uh, for instance, at the, at the first uh, region there, the, at, where we have um, uh, the weight of particle one is really high, uh, but at the same time, the weight of particle five, let's say, is really low. And in, in an adjacent area, it's the other way around. Yeah? Uh, so so in, the, in the first region, we want to keep particle one, and we don't want to keep particle five. And in the second uh, region, we keep uh, particle five. And that means that at the boundary between these two there, there will be discontinuity. So we have to, when you do this kind of localization, you have to think about smoothing fields, et cetera, and it becomes quite messy. And we don't really know how to do that. And the other big problem with localization is that typically, in ocean and atmospheric uh, applications, we have a lot of observation in each of these areas. So even if you do local um, weighting, uh, the, the weights will still be degenerate. So there will be one particle with uh, the highest weight. So again, uh, we have this bias. Um, and localization is not really going to solve the problem, at least not on its own. If you then go to the proposal densities, what I've written here is the, um, as an expression for the, the full posterior PDF. And, the, uh, and you, you recognize uh, sort of the standard uh, um, terms there. Um, so we have the likelihood. Um, and it's after the summation, the first uh, ratio is the likelihood. And then we have the, um, um, uh, the, the proposal density uh, um, part. And then, uh, sorry, the, the ratio of the, of the well, you, you can see it. Eh? The, the, the density divided by the proposal density multiplied by the proposal. So, um, and the thing is that the, um, um, so to, to analyze, sorry, to analyze these schemes, these proposed density schemes, we're going to do the following. Eh? We, we're, going to, we're going to look at a pair of random variables, i and, and x, and i is the index of the particle, and x is the position of the particle in state space. So the weight is a function of both of, the, of, uh, both of them. And, and in the, uh, if, we, if we use this expression for the posterior, then, then we can immediately write down what the weight of each of these particles is. And um, the thing is now, we want the variance in the weights small. Eh? We want equal weight particle filters, so the variance in the weight should be small. And uh, we can write the variance as the lower uh, equation there. I'm not going to explain that, but uh, just to show you that there's an easy way to calculate these weights. Um, so let's look at the so-called optimal proposed density. Yeah, clearly, it's optimal, so that's what we should do. Um, and uh, so if you look at the proposal, it's typically chosen uh, uh, in the form in the, in the first equation. Uh, we choose each, each uh, index uh, with, a, with an equal uh, um, probability. Each, each index has an equal probability. And, um, and it turns out when you make these two choices, then there is indeed an optimal proposal density, an optimal way to do this, meaning uh, uh, a choice for the proposal that gives you the smallest variance in the weights. And that's the one uh, depicted in the third equation. And then you can calculate uh, the variance in the weights. And it turns out that these... Um, the scheme is still degenerate. Therefore, any realistic application doesn't work. And the scheme is bi biased, again, to the best particle. Eh? One particle gets all the weights, and, and we, we see, again, the same problem. Now, there's a very simple way to generate a, a, a better proposal, and that's, that's the following. Eh? We have the same equation now. 
we just, we just uh, crossed out the, uh, the, the Qs, uh, the proposed densities, so we have this expression for the posterior PDF. And now we can just look at this equation and say, oh, wait a minute, we can see that this is actually a, a, a mixture model. We have a mixture PDF here. So uh, one way to see it is, uh, uh, so the, 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 first, the first ratio is just the coefficient for each of the mixture PDFs. And, um, and that effectively means that we, uh, we, we, we choose the, uh, the indices in the following way yeah, as, the, as, the, uh, as the likelihoods. And then uh, we draw the, uh, the axis directly from, the, from that transition density over there. And we find that the variance in the weights is zero. And so it's easy to come up with a particle filter that has um, zero variance in the weights. Um, the problem, however, is that, that typically um, for a small number of particles, there, there still will be, uh, all the particles will be different, but they still will be biased to, uh, uh, to the particle um, with the highest weight, or sort of to, to the highest, the particle with the highest coefficient in this case. Uh, so it doesn't really solve our problem. We, we want it the other way around, and that's why this kind of schemes are being developed. Uh, so this is the so-called equivalence weight scheme, and the way this works is uh, on the horizontal axis, I, I uh, denote the, um, the position of the particle in state space, and in the vertical axis I denote the weight, and clearly uh, where I am in state space, that will give me a different value for the weight of the particle uh, in general. Uh, and, so we, and the numbers there are just the different particles. Uh, so you see this, this, this uh, sort of Gaussian-like curve for particle one, uh, et cetera. Uh, these are not Gaussians, but just to give you an idea. And um, what we do in these schemes, we set a target weight, and then we're going to move all the particles in state space such that they meet the target weight. And you can see immediately that that, that is possible for most of the particles, but for particle number five, and the orange one, it's not possible. It doesn't matter where I put it in state space. It can never reach the target weight. Anyway, so we, we move um, the best fraction row, eh, which is typically, uh, let's say, 0.8, 80% eh, of the particles, such that they, uh, they can reach its target weight. And then, uh, then we add a, a very small random forcing uh, to, to those, um, uh, this technical thing, and then we resample all the particles. So that's, in a nutshell, how these schemes work. And if we then analyze the weights of these particles, um, we see that the weights are actually now divided in, in two parts. Eh? One um, part of the particles that could reach a target weight, and if I look at the full weight of that particle, eh, because this small random uh, noise that they added, uh, the weights are very close to the target weight, eh, but, but it's small epsilon there. And, and there's another part of the particles that have um, weights very close to zero. So if I calculate the full variance, it's the expression over there, and it turns out that the variance is actually larger than for the optimal proposal density. But, but note that we do have a lot of particles, but, but all the particles with the highest weights have the same weight. Yeah, so we've constructed a way of, um, 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 well, still keeping nicely in line with the theory and understanding that the, the, the variance of the weights is high, but we have, we have now a scheme that is biased for a very large number of particles, but for a small number of particles, um, if the, if the by small is smaller than the Monte Carlo error, then, then we're actually in business. We, we're doing the right thing. And of course, you can come up with other proposal schemes. I don't want to talk about that. There's so two-step schemes, um, et cetera. Another final thing is um, um, this optimal to top proposal density idea. And the idea is the following. Hey, we run the particles too close to observation time. And we see this as, a, as a, a bunch, the particles as a bunch of prior particles. And we want to transform them into a, a set of particles drawn from the posterior. So particles drawn from the prior are transformed to particles drawn, uh, drawn from the posterior. So it's a, it's a transport problem. And, um, and so we want to have a, a smooth transformation from, from, from prior to posterior. And, um, and what we use here is the, the kubik leibniz divergence. That's, that's the thing we're going to minimize. Uh, and so we can write down a smooth trans, uh, transition map. Uh, the map has to be smooth. And one way to do that is to, uh, to, to make the map, uh, map iteratively and just take small steps. And so we have the identity here. That is T, the transition uh, operator, the mapping. is identity plus a small, um, a small uh, uh, correction to that, at least to an iterative scheme. So we take all the particles and we slowly uh, move them around in state space until they become particles of the posterior. And the good thing about this is uh, there are no weights over here. And the... Um, and, and as, ah, brilliant, or well, half brilliant, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and if, if our posterior PDF is, is, is on the, um, is, uh, our estimate of the posterior PDF is unbiased, then the whole thing is unbiased, and we've more or less solved the problem. Um, so to conclude now, um, can we construct consistent equal weight particle filters? And the answer is, um, well, here it comes. Localization clearly is not enough. We need more. Um, the optimal proposed, answer, optimal proposed density, it's just not optimal, right? Well, maybe we should just even stop thinking about it. It's just not the right way of thinking about the problem. Sorry. Um, and for small n, it's biased to... Um, Wow. Yep, that's a pin. <clears throat> and it's biased for a small number of particles. Um, and we can, uh, I showed you that we can construct um, equal weight particle filters, but again, eh, they, they have a nice limit when we have an infinite number of particles, but that's not, the, that's, actually that limit is not relevant. The end, to end going to infinity limit is not of interest for geophysical particle filter, because we can never reach that limit. We are really interested in, in small n um, behavior. Uh, so that's, that's the other kind of particle filter. So we, we, we do have stuff now that we know that is biased for n going to infinity. But for small n, uh, as long as this bias is smaller than Monte Carlo error, we're actually solving the problem as good as we can, uh, given the number of runs that we can do. Uh, and then we, we I talked about this mapping uh, just a second ago. So uh, perhaps the main message is that we to really make progress here, we really need to understand the small n, eh, small n statistics. So what is the, the accuracy of the schemes uh, when we have a small number of particles? And I'm, I'm happy to, um, I, I'm, I've, um, well, in statistics, this is, this is a rapidly growing, growing uh, area, so I'm, I'm quite pleased about that. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, can you, can you say it again? The optimal yes. Um, we, we have a, a paper about to be uh, sent out, but there's some, some nice work by Liu and Poo, someone else who, who did something uh, similar. We, so the, the only difference is what we, we put it into our particle filter framework. They did it for a steady, steady uh, case, yeah. But I can, I can point you to that. I have a question about that same mapping. Is that mapping an optimal ma mapping? It seems so simple. Uh, no, it's not, it's, it's not optimal uh, in the sense of optimal transportation. So it, it's not, so, so typically uh, the way it's used in particle filtering is that you do, uh, the mapping is just in, in one go. You, you try to go from the prior to the posterior in one go. Right? That's, that's the, the work of Sebastian Reich, et cetera. And then of course you want to make sure that, the, that, the, um, that each particle uh, moves as little as possible. So. That, that's where the optimality comes in. Um, since we do it in an iterative way, that is not such, such a strong constraint. Okay, let's thank Peter again. Okay, our next speaker is Elena Garcia Bustamante, and the title of her talk is Sensitivity Analysis of Expected Wind Extremes Over the Northwestern Sahara and High Atlas Region. Can I find it? Oh, great, great. Okay. So, thank you. Um, what I'm showing you today is part of a study um, where the main focus was to try to explore the frequency of occurrence of very strong winds but most importantly, uh, to try to provide a sound estimate of the uncertainty associated to these wind return levels in this region, in the northern Sahara and High Atlas region. So Sahara area is uh, the major source of dust uh, all over the world. And this is because they are very strong winds in this region. And they can uh, produce these wind storms, as the one you can see here. This is a sand wall that can be up to one kilometer high in the vertical. So we are interested in, in understanding how to provide um, estimations of how frequent are these damaging winds. 
Uh, so we thought it was interesting to provide you with an idea of what are the mechanisms that uh, trigger uh, at the synoptic and local scale these very strong winds in the region. But the main part of the talk is devoted to provide a, um, sens a methodological sensitivity analysis to, to end up with, a, with an exhaustive uncertainty uh, estimation. And finally, uh, a little idea how the simulations from a regional model can contribute to this uh, estimation on wind return levels. So uh, we are in a region where the precipitation is very little, it's, uh, the soil moisture is small, there's an intense radiation, so the, everything is very warm. So uh, masses uh, are uplifted, and they generate this very well known Saharan low at the surface, so the flux is from the southwestern in, at the surface, and in the upper levels, uh, conditions are the opposite, so we have this uh, high that generates this well-known African east jet. So all in all, we have subsidence and wind shear that favor these downward air masses that, that are called downdrafts or density currents, okay? So um, in the Sahara, we have synoptic scale surface lows and cold fronts related to upper level disturbances, but we have other ingredients that favor ve these very strong winds there. One would be the orography, so we are in the high Atlas region. You can see here the profile, so you can see, think of very strong catabatic flows. Uh, going downward, um, so least cyclogenesis. And the last factor would, would be the deep moist convection that uh, develops this uh, evaporat evaporat uh, evaporatively driven extreme winds. Uh, okay, so when we have some moisture around, some precipitation in the very ar arid uh, atmosphere in the, in the desert, this would evaporate fast and create thermal radions that would accelerate very fast the flow downwards. And they produce this potentially very damaging habub, which is the Arabic word for downburst. Okay, so this is the conditions we have in the region. So we are interested in get, to get to know how often we can expect very strong winds. So um, we perform a sensitivity analysis uh, to estimate uh, wind, spin re wind spin return levels. And this is the evidence we have at hand, the observations. So one main difficulty in this region is that the observations are very scarce. So short, short age of observation is a cis inherent problem uh, when we want to extrapolate values out of the observational period, of course, but in the desertic areas, this problem is even uh, worse. So this symbol stands from sites, different institutions providing data. Um, color relates the length in, of the observational period, so most of them are 10 years at least. And we have two types of observations, so we have daily maximum 10, mi uh, 10 minutes averages, and also daily maximum wind gas. The gas is related to uh, the maximum wind speed in, in the order of three seconds or less. So these are the most damaging ones, but we also have these daily uh, maximum mean averages. We are in this control gap that relates turbulence with uh, synoptic scale. So these are strong sustained winds, as we can think of them. So uh, these observations were raw, no quality control. So we went through a quality control of all these data. These are the reference here. And bas basically, we were eliminating all unphysical values, repetition, fake, fake columns, um, uh, long-term biases and so on, so we could have high-quality data for the posterior analysis. So what we, could, we can do is at each one of the sites we have observational series. This is a schematic symbolic series of wind here, so we select the wind maxima in a way to be defined afterwards, and then these maxima are then uh, fitted to a probability distribution belonging to the um, extreme value theory. So we are very much interested in having and uh, focusing what happens at the tails of the distribution, of course, because we are f uh, focusing on the most extreme winds. And then from the uh, particularities and character characteristics of this uh, theoretical distribution, we can extrapolate wind return levels. It's a typical uh, return level, return period plot. So here is probabilities, essentially, and this is the return level that is expected to be exceeded or equaled at least once, no, at least not, on average once. Uh, each return period, so we have a, a best case, and we have also a um, uh, confidence interval providing some uncertainty. So we are interested in get to know how to provide uh, a confidence interval and uncertainty estimate that avoids subjectivity in the selection of the methods. How we do this 
is exploring all possibilities we have at hand. So we are focusing on the different methodological choices. There are other works that have done this before, but not in such an exhaustive way, let's say so. So we have different variants that we can explore. One of these would be the uh, probability distribution. There are two families, for those that they are familiar with that. This is the block maxima family, where the extremes are defined at the single event in one uh, specific period. And then there are the peak over, th over threshold family that uh, considers only the excesses over a, a certain value or, or threshold. Uh, they have advantages and drawbacks, so they are different, only related to the two main assumptions when we are talking about uh, extreme value theory, which is stationarity and independence. So we explore all these uh, possibilities here. Also, the parameter estimation method is important because sometimes the estimation of return levels will change depending on this. So we explore maximum likelihood, generalized like, uh, likelihood, uh, Bayesian methods, and so on. Uh, how we define the maxima, it's, it's important here. So uh, are we considering annual values, monthly values or so? Um, we explore several possibilities. Also the confidence interval method. And finally, the goodness, goodness of fit test, because we believe that um, how well the observations fit to a theoretical distribution should not depend on the specific particularities of any of the tests. So we explore all of them. And so considering all these possibilities and combining them all together over our all data set, we produce finally almost 15,000 fits. And this is what we call we are sampling the uncertainty as, as much as possible. Now we have to do something with it. We have to constrain it. So constraining here means that we do not want to keep all these fits that they are not reliable because uh, the, how reliable are the estimates of wind return levels afterwards depends on the quality of the fitness, of the, of the fitting. Uh, so um, we run five tests and we count how many of our experiments uh, succeeds none, one, up to five uh, experiments. So we can see that many of them, they don't survive anything at all. And then out of the rest, there are many, up to 30% of succeeding cases. So we only keep all those cases that succeed all uh, goodness of fit tests at a time. Now we can also um, make the question whether this succeeding or failing the, te the, the tests depends on any specific uh, methodological variant or choice. So what we have represented here is the same as before, but segregating according to the different methodological variants in different colors. So for instance, here would be how we select the maxima, uh, the family distribution, and so on. If we focus here, the stacks represent the specific particular or particular choices. So for instance, the light blue would be that we have selected only annual values. So uh, this is monthly and so on. What we can see, for instance, here is that, is that there is a large number of of cases where annual values are not enough to provide a good fit to the theoretical probability distribution. So the amount of data is very important in, the, in this case. For the rest, there's no specific differences between uh, the choices or the methodological variants. So more or less all these are the same proportion of succeeding cases. So we can say that succeeding experiments do not show a preference uh, for a specific method. Now, we have selected uh, our, we have filtered out the non-valid cases, so we keep at each side of our database only those cases that we consider reliable, those fits. So we can have one plot like this for each one of the fits. So we have our best case and we are able to sample all the confidence intervals uh, that the method provide. So we can think of confidence now in terms of probability, so we should this probability distribution now, and we come here. So this black probability distributions here um, uh, represents the probability of having, for instance, for a specific return period. Here we are talking about the 50-year return period, as an example, uh, the probability of having these win uh, return levels here in the horizontal. Okay, so as we have several successful cases at each side, what we can do is out of all the resulting PDFs, we can calculate the mixture probability of all of them, which is the blue line here in a schematic uh, plot. And then this, is ex this probability distribution, the mixture one, is exactly what you see now in these maps. So these circles represent uh, 
each side the, the median and the confidence intervals of, of the resulting final uh, mixture probability distributions. So this is what we have here, different sides, different uh, uh, expectation of extreme winds. For instance, here we have uh, the most extreme winds expected up to 45 uh, uh, meters per second. So this depends a lot on the orography, as we can see. Um, now, we, the ideal situation would be that we have uh, the spatial variability of the expected extreme winds in a higher resolution, but unfortunately with the observation, as we said before, we cannot do it because this is very scarce, so we can think now in the simulations, okay? So we think of a regional simulation, but unfortunately we cannot run a simulation of 50 years long, so what we do? What we do then is to simulate just 12 years, same length as the observations, uh, at, a very, at a high resolution, let's say three kilometers in the region. This would be the domains that the simulation considers. And then uh, we validate, of course, the simulation. We, we see that it reproduces well the variability of the wind in the region. And, and then we apply exactly the same type of analysis we have applied to all of the observational sites at each one of the grid points of the simulation. So it means we, we apply all the cases, combining all the methodologies. We filter those cases that we don't like, that they are um, not providing a good uh, fit to the observations. And then we calculate the probability distributions of the extreme winds for each one of the return periods. And what you are seeing here is the uh, 50 year uh, median of the uh, wind speed. So this would represent uh, the wind that is expected to, to be equal with a chance of 0 .2, 0 0.02 in a single year. So this goes very well with the orography, as you can see here. So the higher winds are expected at the top of the mountains. And I'm not sure you can see here, but these circles represent uh, the same but from the side of the observations to compare um, how the simulation can reproduce the uh, uh, extreme wind return level. So the, uh, the idea that you cannot see them very well is good because this means that they, 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 are, very un they are similar and, and they provide similar estimations of, of wind return levels uh, if compared with the observations. So getting to the end now, what we have done is to compile and quality control observational data over the Western Sahara region and run a simulation of 12 years at a high resolution and to systematically sample all the methodological choice to provide wind return level probabilities and providing uh, multiple rigorous tests to try to give uh, an exhaustive uncertainty estimate of the wind return levels. So we've seen that the amount of the observational record is essential for the goodness of fit, as we could expect. Uh, the goodness of fit of the survival experiments does not seem to depend on any specific methodological choices, uh, but we have seen that different methods indeed, as expected as well, provide different estimates of extreme wind return value. So we wanted to provide a representation, a probabilistic representation of this uncertainty. Um, and we also saw that uh, based on the simulation, on the uh, reality of the simulation that the spatial variability of the wind return levels from the model goes well along with, uh, with that of the observations and follow essentially the orography there. So yeah, that was, thank you. One quick question for Elena. Yes. Yeah. That's going to be great. There's an additional uh, class of uh, PDF called stochastically generated skew distributions, and they're dynamically based. And they look just like what you were showing, and, you don't have, and there's a, uh, a test to see whether or not they actually are appropriate. I mean, unfortunately, you can always fit in a PDF, but very few of these fitting procedures give you a Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Is this type of a point process uh, distribution? What do you? No, no, it's a stochastic differential equation. Okay. And, uh, the, the nice thing is that you can use the entire data set to fit it. It has Pareto tables. Okay. And so, uh, but you can use the entire data set in order to fit the distribution. So uh, you don't have to confine yourself to the extremes to get the Pareto tables. 
Okay, and, and then you are focusing for the goodness of, of uh, feet, the goodness of the feet. You are focusing in the tail of the distribution, maybe. For the goodness, to assess the real, re reliability of, this fit, uh, of the feed, you are focusing in the tail of the distribution, maybe? Um, the thing is that you fit the entire PDF. Yeah, and yeah. Then there's a test to see whether the PDF is appropriate to the data that you have. Yeah, yeah. And that sounds interesting. If it's appropriate to all of the data, then it's appropriate to the case. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, I'll thank Elena again. Sorry. Thank you. Yes. Okay, our final uh, speaker before the break is Yue Zhao, and he'll be talking about Bayesian model selection of error models in Bayesian inverse problems. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about Bayesian error model selection in Bayesian inverse problems. Uh, it's part of my um, PhD research. Uh, first of all, um, I'm going to uh, review inverse problems really quick. Um, inverse problems usually require a uh, forward relationship as shown in the equation above. Um, we have forward model F, uh, we have input S, uh, and there are some random arrows involved in this process. Um, and we have available data Y. So for inverse problems, we are estimating the input data S given some available measurements y. And because um, in most cases, the available measurements y are usually, in spar uh, are usually sparse, and s is in very large numbers. So inverse problems are mostly um, ill-posed problems. And to solve such problems, we need some regularizations. Uh, and for Bayesian inverse problems, actually, we're using um, some priors uh, we assign these priors onto the uh, unknown variable S to prevent overfitting. Uh, and this is a way of regularization for inverse problems. Uh, according to the Bayes rule and uh, using the Bayesian formulation, we can draw samples from the posterior distribution and that's uh, our estimate of the interested variable S. Um, likelihood function, um, we, we need to use a uh, likelihood function to constrain our estimates. Uh, likelihood function are mostly determined by uh, the characteristics of arrows. Uh, the most commonly used error model could be Gaussian model. Uh, that means we assume uh, random arrows epsilon are from a Gaussian model with zero mean and the sigma as the covariance matrix. Uh, there are three different kinds of covariance matrix. Uh, the most commonly used is independently and identically distributed random arrows, the IID model, which we assume um, sigma matrix is, um, uh, it, e it equals lower sigma squared times the identity matrix. Uh, another um, assumption, uh, Another error model we used is independently distributed error model. Um, that is a diagonal matrix for sigma. And correlated random arrows usually requires a full and dense sigma matrix. So our, quest, um, so our question is, uh, what is the best model for Bayesian inverse problems, or if IID model will be sufficient for Bayesian inverse problems? Uh, in order to select one of the um, maybe best models from these three models, we need a measure to um, see its goodness of each model. So we use um, Bayesian evidence as the measure. Uh, it usually reflects the confidence in model M given some available data Y. Uh, here I give an equation for the expression of Bayesian evidence. Uh, it can be seen as the integration of likelihood P uh, over the prior mass. PS. Um, different models usually yield different priors or likelihoods, thus it gives different Bayesian evidences. So by comparing Bayesian evidences, we can know uh, which model will fit into the framework better. So next problem is how we're going to compute the Bayesian evidence. Uh, here are at least four ways uh, for computing Bayesian evidences. 
uh, information criteria. It's a way to approximate Bayesian evidence. Uh, brutal force Monte Carlo integration, which is draw, um, use Monte Carlo to draw samples from the prior and do the integration. Uh, but it's very computationally expensive. Um, Monte Carlo integration using posterior samples. Uh, this will yield a um, biased estimate of Bayesian evidence. Uh, we use the fourth one, the nasty sampling approach for um, computing Bayesian evidence for our research. Nasty sampling defines a variable x as a function of lambda, where lambda is the threshold of likelihood, we can see here. And we can understand the prior mass x uh, as the enclosed the prior mass by the uh, likelihood function. So as the threshold increases, the prior mass enclosed in this area will decrease. So we can see um, x lambda will decrease from one to zero as lambda increases, because there will be only a few samples fall into high likelihood area. Thus, we can uh, reformulate Bayesian evidence into a one-dimensional integration problem instead of doing a multi-dimensional um, integration problem. Uh, here's the uh, example of uh, z versus log pro uh, enclosed prior mass log x. Uh, we can see for most of the prior mass, the Bayesian evidence is very, uh, very small because samples in this area has very low uh, likelihood. But uh, as we shrink the um, enclosed prior mass, um, samples will have more likelihood uh, and the Bayesian evidence will also increase until it reaches some plateau on top. Next problem is how to sample on those, um, how to draw samples from prior given such uh, constrained likelihood values. Uh, we use constrained Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to do such tasks. Um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is uh, quite universal for, draw, for drawing samples from priors, but uh, it cannot recognize any kind of constraints. Uh, here I made an animation to show how it works. Um, the blue line uh, represents the constraint uh, that we have for the likelihood. Uh, on the left will be the constraint domain, and we want our samples to be, uh, to be in this domain. But when we're doing um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, we're, uh, we're simulating the motion of the sample point in the, dimensional, uh, in the n-dimensional space. Um, but when it goes beyond the constraint, uh, uh, it cannot uh, recognize such constraint, and it, would, uh, and it will keep going until it goes out the constraint domain. But when we're using a uh, constrained Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, when it goes beyond the domain, uh, we will reflect the sample, the, direction, the moving direction of the sample by its normal vector. And it will come back into the constrained domain. Thus, we can have all our samples within the constrained domain. And that's how we draw constrained uh, samples from the prior. Um, after we formulate such a, a computational framework, um, we test our method on a numerical experiment. We choose a um, simple linear convolution forward model. Uh, we uh, that is, I simplify the f function into a sensitivity matrix H, and we will treat H as the true underlying forward model. We, uh, we didn't consider any uncertainties involved in the matrix H. Uh, the true value of S is generated by some known functions, and we will see the pattern of S later. Uh, we calculate the model output and add some random arrows uh, based on different arrow models, such, uh, so we can form some contaminated data, and we use this contaminated data as the, availa as the available measurement for Bayesian inverse and for um, Bayesian evidence computation. Um, here I show uh, the result of Bayesian evidence for IID error data. Uh, that is, we add independently and identically distributed error onto uh, our model output and use that as the, uh, as the measurement. And then we calculate the uh, log Bayesian evidence. Uh, we calculate the misfit between, uh, between simulated model output and measurement. 
the misfit between um, the true S and the uh, inverse results. Uh, here, we, I, ha I have five different kinds of models. It's basically ID models, uh, ID models and correlated models. But I also changed the precision of ID model. That means uh, I lowered the value of um, sigma squared. So we will have a high precision ID model. And uh, according to the results, we see that um, correlated model received the highest Bayesian evidence score and uh, produces the best fit to the true underlying S value. Uh, even though high precision uh, IID model also gives a very good fit to the uh, measurement. Then we test our result on another error data set. Um, IID model, uh, uh, the, the result is still uh, almost the same. Uh, correlated model performs best in Bayesian evidence. But uh, we also found that high precision IID model outperforms high, uh, high precision independently distributed model. That means even if the uh, arrow are distributed uh, as an ID model, we can still use ID model to, um, to do the Bayesian inverse. Uh, Bayesian evidence uh, for uh, correlated error data um, still we have um, correlated model as the best one, but I think if we uh, keep increasing the precision of IID model, we can also have a much higher uh, Bayesian evidence, and maybe it can outperform correlated model in this case. Um, here's an uh, example for um, IID error data. I use IID model to inverse it, um, uh, this is low, low precision ID model, low precision ID model and correlated model. And here are two high precision model results. Uh, the right line represents the true value. Um, the black line is the best estimate given the posterior uh, samples. Uh, according to the results, uh, correlated model gives the best fit to the true value. The misfit between the black line and the uh, the right line is the smallest. Uh, and if we increase the um, model precision, the fading will also gain some improvements. Uh, to conclude, um, correlated model uh, for the uh, numerical experiments added, um, correlated model received the highest Bayesian evidence. Uh, IID model uh, reproduces the, the available measurements best. Um, correlated model estimate the model er uh, the the interest variable as best. But I also believe if uh, if we use higher precision for um, IID models, we can still um, produce uh, outperform the correlated model. Um, yeah. Uh, that will be all, so ready to take your questions. Questions? Yeah, okay, uh, I, I think I get, uh, I get your question. Uh, actually, um, I use uh, the measurement to, uh, to, inverse, to inverse the interest variable S, but here I'm not selecting the model for S, I'm selecting the model for the arrow, and then I put the, um, put the simulated S back into the um, nasty sampling to um, see the Bayesian score for this um, covariance matrix. Um, and why I choose um, Bayesian evidence as the way? Uh, uh, because I, um, for, my, uh, for my inverse problems, I use all the Bayesian stuff, so I think uh, it will be more consistent if I use a, another Bayesian way to do the model selection. But of course, model selection can be done in 
uh, some other ways like uh, cross-validation, um, something like that. This is not the only way, but I think it's more consistent with Bayesian inverse. Oh, uh, huh, uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I don't think nasty sampling can do that, but of course, uh, I think to find the PDF of the model will be, um, some further research, maybe, yeah. I think that's something that you can, quite good to discuss over there. <laughs> I think, uh, thank you very much for a very good talk and uh, thank you for the Just to remind you, we have two sessions this year for the first time ever, so please, if you are coming again, we'll be back here at four o'clock for part two. Okay, go and enjoy your beer. And post us tomorrow. <laughs> and and then we have post us tomorrow morning.